It's been an awesome morning so far, hasn't it? Come on. I'm like, I'm ready to go home. I'll just pray again and we'll just get out of here. There is a lot to be excited about in the life of our church, in the life of, of our members individually. What an incredible testimony of baptism this morning. VBS is coming up, which means it's the best week of the summer, and it's the best sleep I'll get here in about two weeks as we all be able to kind of like get rid I'll sweat more than normally. I'm sweating right now. But it'll be more as we get everything ready for VBS. How many of you guys remember going to VBS as a kid? Some of y'all are lying. I know you went to VBS because you're here right now. It, 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 as you think of those things and we kind of dwell, especially around VBS, I, I think a lot about my own time in children's ministry and growing up in church and all the things that go along with that. And one of the things that, that most identified my adolescent child life as a believer and as a Southern Baptist and as a missionary kid was VeggieTales. Who remembers VeggieTales? Who remembers the theme song to VeggieTales? Stephen's going to come out and lead us in the theme song of VeggieTales. Every time I think of VeggieTales, I, I, I immediately have this issue, at least with my own memory, because if I'm honest, there are Bible stories that I don't ever remember hearing for the first time. It's like they've just always been there. I can't go back to the moment that I first heard the story of Moses or Noah or David. I, I, I don't have that particular memory. And if I'm really honest, I don't know if I could tell you with absolute certainty from my own memory whether I have a earlier memory of the actual biblical story or the VeggieTales equivalent of that story. David and Goliath, I don't remember a time where I didn't know the story of David facing Goliath and finding the stones and getting the slingshot and attacking the giant. But I also don't remember a time where that little broccoli piece goes out to fight the big giant cucumber and delivers pizza to all of his brothers. Those two things are deeply intertwined for me. But as I grew up and I began to read more of the biblical text and I got to know more of the story, I realized there's a lot that happens in the Bible that's not very VeggieTale friendly. There's a lot in David's life that's not very VeggieTale friendly. Now, there are attempts at some of those stories, but, but this morning what we're going to get at is the life of David and a part of the life of David that would never be accurately depicted in a VeggieTales story. Life gets lifey, as Pastor has been talking about a lot recently. And occasionally, life gets too lifey, even for veggie tales. So while it's awesome, it always kind of cut away from the stories whenever they got a little bit too un veggie tale -y. Or they would change the story so much that the meaning really got lost. And this morning, we look at a psalm that's part of a larger narrative of the life of King David that, that is, without a doubt, the, the most tumultuous part of his Life. And we'll eventually find ourselves to Psalm 51. But, but to get there, as we end our summer in the Psalm series this morning, every once in a while in the Psalms, you get a time where the Psalm fits in directly to something else that's happening concurrently in the biblical text. And in Psalm 51, that if you've read the Psalms very much, you, you probably are, are at least a little bit familiar with, that Psalm fits in a context that we have to know before we look at what happens in Psalm 51. And to do that, we need to look at 2 Samuel 11 and 12. And we're going to keep this theme that Pastor has been hitting on about what to do or what happens when life gets lifey. We've talked about it at great length. We've looked at what happens when what or when life gets lifey because of things that are going on around you or things other people have done or what God's response is when life gets lifey. But this story of David and the subsequent psalm is going to get at what happens when life gets lifey, but it's our fault. What happens when life gets lifey? Not because sickness comes or tragedy comes, but because we've messed up. When the destruction comes, not because of something happening to us, but because of our own sinful choices that we make. And David's going to set that up for us. Now, when we think about King David, the, the earliest portion of his story is a, a fairly physically unimpressive specimen that is a shepherd boy out in the wilderness. And all of his brothers were more impressive, and he just kind of kept to himself and, and did the shepherding thing, which was frankly pretty impressive because he was out there killing bears and lions and tigers and everything else that I think is in The Wizard of Oz. But he was taking care of those, defending the sheep, and he was eventually chosen and anointed to be the next king following Saul. 
And he becomes the warrior, politician, poet, leader, king. He's holy. He's probably the most impressive leader in all of history. If you go back and you take David out of the context of just the biblical story and put him up against Caesar and Alexander the Great and any of these other great historical figures, David is going to match up really, really well. There are few people in all of human history that would be as impressive to us on their stat sheet as King David was. But perfect, he was not. And we're about to focus on the most awful episode of his life, which reminds us, as we all know, people will always let us down, no matter how impressive or unimpressive they are. So we hold on to the truth that our Lord will not and that he is faithful. And what we want to do this morning is I want to look at the story of 2 Samuel 11 and 12. We won't read all of it, but we have to know kind of the narrative that's happening and where the psalm fits into that narrative. And it's going to happen in four key parts. And as we look at that narrative, we'll walk through it and go through it. And then at the end, we'll look at how do we respond and how do we apply the, the narrative of King David's kind of fall from grace to our own lives. So as we look at, at 2 Samuel in, in chapter 11, starting in verse 1, just read the first verse with me. It says, in the spring, when kings march out to war, David sent Joab of his officers and all Israel. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. David remained in Jerusalem. This is the thing that's going to kickstart all of this event. At the time kings go to war, David didn't. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. And we don't get a whole lot of insight as to why that was. It could be one of a thousand reasons. But what we know is where he was supposed to be was out at war with his people. And where he was was home. And he wasn't just home and kind of taking care of business and doing what he was supposed to be doing. But as he wasn't where he was supposed to be physically, he goes out to his balcony area and begins looking where he shouldn't have been looking. If you, if you talk to Brad or anybody else that's gone to Israel or looked at, at pictures, you can kind of tell the way that the, the city was set up was such that David could walk out and basically see the majority of the city that was in his purview. So what he does one of these days is he wakes up and he's, he's, he's still in his kingdom and he goes out and he stands on the ledge and he looks down and he sees a woman bathing in what she thought was private, sees her, desires her, and inquires about her. And his people come back and they say, well, that's Bathsheba. That's the wife of Uriah. Now, to not count for all of the poor decisions he's made before then, that should be the linchpin point where he backs off, makes the right choice, shuts down, doesn't pursue any further. But he doesn't. He's not where he's supposed to be. He's looking where he's not supposed to look. He asks questions that he really shouldn't have been asking. And whenever he gets an answer that should have shut him down, he says, go get her, bring her to me. So Bathsheba is brought to David. David sleeps with Bathsheba, sends her away. And then a little bit later gets word from Bathsheba via a messenger. And the only dialogue we have from Bathsheba in this narrative, I'm pregnant. Now David is in a world of trouble. He should have already been in a world of trouble, but now the consequences of what he has done are compounding and compounding and compounding. So he begins to do what most of us, if we're honest, do whenever our sin has a threat of finding us out. And he's going to try and cover it up. He's going to try to do this in a couple of different ways. The first is he has Uriah brought to him as the people kind of come back in for a little bit of respite from the war and tells him, go home, wash your feet, enjoy some time away. And Uriah doesn't do that. He doesn't go home. He doesn't enjoy the benefit or the privilege of being back in his own place because in juxtaposition to David, Uriah is actually handling all of this with high honor really, really well. And so David's plan of having Uriah go home so that he can sleep with his wife and everybody can just think, oh, that's Uriah's kid. doesn't work. So he says, okay, we'll try this again. 
And he has your eye come to him, and this time he gets him drunk. He thinks, well, maybe if I get him drunk, then he'll go home, and then all of my plan will just work out. But even intoxicated, Uriah doesn't go home. He stays where he's supposed to stay, which is a little hard for us to understand. The, the people of Israel, all of this, war was not just a geopolitical thing. It was a holy thing. There's a lot of religious subtext to the duty that he was accomplishing. And so after that doesn't work, David jumps to have it finally dealt with. He tells his leaders, he says, whenever they go back out, send Uriah to the front line and then pull everybody back. And as you send him to the front line and pull everybody back, then he'll be killed. He conspires to have Uriah put to death. And it works. Uriah dies. The generals come back and they tell him he's dead. David goes, takes Bathsheba as a wife. And the story in chapter 11 ends saying that the Lord considered what David had done to be evil. That the first part of all of this narrative is sin. David sins grievously. Grievously, grievously. It's hard to really articulate all of the things. We don't have time to go into all the details of why every single step of what he does is awful. But he sins and sins intensely. He wasn't where he was supposed to be, looking where he shouldn't have been looking, asking something that he shouldn't have been asking, talking to someone who was, or taking someone who wasn't his, attempting a deceptive cover up, and then attempting it again by drugging Uriah. And then when that doesn't work, he covers it up with violence. Bathsheba goes into mourning. David takes her. And all of this obviously displeases the Lord. So what happens next? This King David, a man after God's own heart, the one who slayed Goliath with a slingshot and a sword. How is the Lord going to respond to this sin by this king? This goes into chapter 12. The first part is sin. The second part is confrontation. Confrontation. The Lord sends the prophet Nathan. And Nathan comes in before David and he tells a story that David's going to assumedly believe is true. And he tells the story of a, a rich man who had all kinds of livestock and sheep and oxen, all of these kinds of things, had more than he could possibly know what to do with. And another man who is poor, who has one little lamb. And he values and loves and treasures that lamb more than he could possibly express. So he sets up these two different figures. And then he says, a traveler comes along who's in need of food. And the rich man goes to feed him. And instead of taking any of the livestock from his own field, he goes and he takes the lamb away from the poor man, who that was all he had. And he kills that lamb to feed the traveler. And this greatly displeases David. David's fiery anger is lit, the text says. And he says that, that as surely as God lives, this man will be put to death, but only after he pays back four times what is owed to the poor man. And then Nathan, in one of the most intense got you moments in the Old Testament, says, David, that's you. He said, this is you. Do you not realize that you have Everything. The Lord has given you everything. The Lord has elevated a little shepherd boy to be the king of one of the most powerful empires the world had known up until that point. He had everything. The Bible tells us that David had about six wives before this episode with Bathsheba. He had more riches than he knew what to do with. He had more power than could possibly be comprehended by any of us in this room. He had everything and it wasn't enough. He says, you had it all and it wasn't enough. And, and, and making it worse, if you would have just asked the Lord, he would have given you more, even though you already have all this. But you didn't 
accept that. That wasn't good enough for you. You had to go and take someone who was not yours and belong to somebody else, which is a huge, heavy warning for us even at, at this point, knowing what, whatever we chase or whatever we desire, the, the, the concept of more is never going to be enough. We'll never be able to have enough of whatever the thing is for us to really fulfill our hearts. We'll always want something else. So David hears this from Nathan. He's confronted by the prophet. He is told and shown his sin with a mirror. And then he's told that because of this, because of what you've done, the sword, violence, is never going to leave your house. It is going to stay with you till the end. So we have the sin, we have confrontation. The third part of the story is the response. How is David going to respond to what has just been told to him, to what he's just been confronted with? The heavy weight of his sin. And this is where, to give David credit, almost any other king in that day and age would have killed Nathan. And so he gets a little bit of brownie points for not killing Nathan, but not a lot. He gets the most amount of respect that we should have because of how he responds. It's not in pride. It's not in arrogance. and It's not in defending himself. But he is actually going to respond in repentance. And this has been a heavy story. We've had to fly through a really heavy, awful series of events. But we do it so that we can get to this response and, and hopefully read it with the weight that's behind it. Imagine the shame that David is feeling or should be feeling. Imagine the shame that you or I feel when we sin grievously, when we've really messed up, not when we've just told a little white lie or we've, or we've done something that we might even articulate ourselves as, as you know, it's, it's sin, we got to be better, but it's not that big of a deal. The, the biggest, most awful thing you've ever done in your life. Think of how ashamed you are of that and bringing it before the Lord. How will David talk to God? What is he going to tell us about what he believes about God's character? What is he going to tell us about what he believes he's done? He has taken another man's wife, killed the husband, and abandoned his responsibilities as a king. That's the context that goes along with Psalm 51. So with all of that kind of in the back of our heads, look at Psalm 51. Because it tells us that David realized that he had sinned and said in verse 13, I have sinned against the Lord. So what does he say? If you read the little descriptor right before verse 1, it says, For the choir director, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had gone to Bathsheba. He says, Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion. Completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin, for I am conscious of my rebellion and my sin is always before me. Against you and you alone have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence and you are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self and you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Turn away your face from my sins and blot out all my guilt. God, create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. Then I will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you. Save me from the guilt of bloodshed, God. God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not want a sacrifice, or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart, God. In your good pleasure, cause Zion to prosper. Build the walls of Jerusalem. 
Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings, and then bulls will be offered on your altar. This is David's response to what he's done. And it is filled with declarations of of God's love and faithfulness and goodness and grace and power in, in realizing the sin that he has committed, not just against Bathsheba, not just against Israel, and not just against, but, but to God himself. And he asks for what only God can provide, which is true forgiveness and cleanliness and to restore right relationship with him. And the Lord does it. David does this terrible, awful thing. And he repents. And the Lord is kind and gracious and forgiving. But Nathan's pronouncement of what's going to happen stays, which is the last part of our story, the fallout. David's son with Bathsheba will die. And in a total completion of the ominous declaration of David against what should happen to the rich man, that he should have to pay back four times, by the end of David's life, four of his sons will die. Fourfold. He prayed for the son he had with Bathsheba, fasted for him, but he still died. David had sinned. And he had repented and he had been forgiven. But forgiveness did not negate the wake of destruction his sin had caused. He would not know much beyond violence and suffering after this. And, and, and all of this, and all of this kind of really intense, there, there are few stories in the Bible more serious and heavy than what happens here with David and Bathsheba. And it's a reminder for us as we begin to think about how, how we possibly apply that. Because I, I'm assuming, I don't want to assume greatly, but I'm assuming that in this room, nobody has taken another man's wife and then killed the husband. If, if you've done that, then you can talk to us after the service. But I'm assuming that no one has done that. So we can all breathe a little bit deep of this kind of a story, not necessarily. I've never sat in a room where we've discussed this story and somebody comes up after and says, I've got to confess to a murder. But normally what this does to us is it kind of triggers our own internal conscience or feeling around our own sin, which is why right now, possibly, I'm definitely feeling it. Any sin that we have in our lives after reading a story like this, we, our, our hearts kind of start beating a little faster. We start thinking about where we have fallen short and what we have done. And there's going to be all kinds of, of grace in this story. But there, there's a heaviness that comes when we talk about what's being done here and the response after. And it's something that I heard years and years ago at a, at a, at a student conference, and it, it is incredibly corny and cheesy, but man, it's true. Sin is always going to take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. The sin in our lives is always, it's, ne it's never going to kind of be in our mind, well, I'll just go this far. It's not how it works. We, we might think in our head, like, this is the line, and I'm only going to walk up to this line. I'm going to get as close to it as I can. And I might barely cross over, but there's no chance I'm going to line up way over there. But inevitably, whenever we allow ourselves to be brought into any type of sin, it takes us all the way down the road until we repent. Until we actually get convicted of our own sin and turn away from it and start walking the other direction, all sin does is going to take us the opposite way from God. And not only is it going to take us farther than we want to go, we don't get to just go on an overnight stay. Well, I'm just going to do this and it's just going to be real quick and then it's going to be over. I'll get back to normal life. It's, that's not how it works. It keeps you there longer than you had ever intended on staying there. And not only that, when you think through whatever the consequences are before contemplating whatever kind of sin we would want to commit, we'll think, well, it's, it's not that big of a deal. That the, the, it, it, the, the effects won't be crazy. It might be a little bit bad, but, but it'll be all right. God will be gracious. He'll forgive. It will always cost you more 
than you ever want to pay. If there was somehow some magical way for God to stand before us right before we were about to commit a sin and say, listen, I know you just want to go here, but this is actually going to take you all the way over there. And I know that you think it's only going to last a couple of hours, but it's actually going to last several months, if not years. And I know you think it's only going to kind of mess up this relationship or a little bit cost you this aspect of your life, but really what it's going to do and then lay out all of the potential consequences. Because I don't think any of us, if we had that kind of moment of clarity, would be like, yep, still going to do it. But that's not the way life works. I would argue he actually has given us that type of warning in stories like these. But it's always going to take you farther than you want to go, keep you there longer than you had planned on, and cost more than you had ever intended. So when we think about this story and how it affects or impacts us, how do we apply a, a, a situation that is, is for, for pretty much all of us so incredibly foreign? I can't identify with the power that it would be to, to be a king and to be able to just have anything I wanted if I just said it. But we all know what it's like to struggle in our own sin. What do we take from that? What do we take from David's story? What do we take from his song of repentance? Thinking about sin, a couple of things. One, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. If we could leave and just remind ourselves of anything whenever we come to to any kind of decision-making process in those moments where we actually are contemplating whether or not to sin, if we could get this into our bones, we would save ourselves all kinds of tragedy by just reminding ourselves it's not worth it. Whatever it is, the little white lie to keep you out of a a really awkward conversation, not confronting someone on sin or having you confronted with sin to to escape awkwardness or, or an uncomfortable time, keeping away or sacrificing certain things so that you don't have access to sin, keeping away from relation, whatever it is, it's not worth it. And on the even more practical note, one of the things that we take from David that's incredibly simple is just a kind of absolute non-negotiable rule for your own life. First, be where you're supposed to be. Be where you're supposed to be. David was not supposed to be home. He was supposed to be somewhere else. If he was where he was supposed to be, this doesn't happen. And we can all think of all kinds of situations where the, the, the sin comes down the road of a decision to normally be somewhere where we're not supposed to be. And there's all kinds of nuance here. There's a couple of easy examples. If you don't want to fall into sexual sin, don't go to a strip club. And work that all the way back to any kind of other sin. Do not be where you're not supposed to be. Be where you're supposed to be. Location plays a huge role in what's happening here. David was, it's why the whole story starts off with when kings were away at war, David wasn't. He was supposed to be somewhere else. So be where you're supposed to be. And two, do what you're supposed to do. Think of how much simpler your life would be if you had always made those decisions. If you were always where you were supposed to be and always doing what you're supposed to do. The sin in my life, and I'm assuming the sin in your life, often comes because I'm doing something I'm not supposed to be doing. Duh. I'm I'm somewhere where I'm not supposed to be. There's so many things that, that even looking back, that I remember being told by like student pastors or my parents or pastors or like one of them was this. Nothing good happens after 2 a.m. Anyone ever hear that one? Now, My own, like, I've got a good bit of contrarian built into me, not quite as much as my brother, but enough to make an impact. Where if somebody says that, I'm like, well, you know what you could be doing after 2 a.m.? Sharing the gospel with people. What if Frida had that conversation at 2 in the morning? She comes down, I know you said nothing good happens after 2 a.m., but in fact, something awesome happened after 2 a.m. I'll grant you this. If you have more evangelistic conversations after 2 a.m. than you do regrets in your life, you win. You can do whatever you want, whenever you want to do it. But for the majority of us, at least for me, I don't have a whole lot of, it was 2.30 in the morning and I was out making disciples. I've got a whole lot of, 
was after 2.30 in the morning and I was doing something stupid. Some of that just baseline wisdom that doesn't even sound all that spiritual in the face of it is radically spiritual. It's one of my favorite things about the Old Testament, especially. It has some of these moments where the wisdom just seems so cut and dry. The time where God told somebody one time, hey, uh, you just need to go to sleep and eat some food. You'll feel better in the morning. That's great advice a lot of the times. And whenever it comes to even sin like this, the, the way that we guard ourselves and keep ourselves from falling spectacularly, is just doing the simple things. Be diligent in the little things if you want to guard the big things. It never, ever starts as this massive, I I don't think David woke up that morning and thought, I think I'm going to kill Uriah. I think I'm going to do that. If we're not diligent in the small the big's going to fall. If we know we're supposed to do a few things, if we know we're supposed to be following Christ in the word, deep in prayer, in community with believers, all those kind of things, they're like, no brainers, of course I'm supposed to do that. If you stop doing that, it's remarkable how once you stop doing a few tiny things, big impact comes along. There was a Casting Crown song that came out in like the late 90s, early 2000s, Slow Fade. It's a little dated now, but the truth of it is incredibly accurate. It's not one day you're this really faithful, awesome, every husband, father, believer, Christ follower, and then the next day it's just flip switches and you're completely, it's slow choices in tiny things that seem like they don't matter at the time, but compounded will change everything. If you want to protect your marriage, if you want to protect your family, if you want to protect your your faith, your testimony, do the little things right. And you won't have to make grand, big, epic stands for the big things because they'll be taken care of. So that's sin. Confrontation. What do we take from the way that, that David handles this confrontation? First thing, have people in your life that you have given permission to get in your face. Now, that can't be everybody, and it shouldn't be everybody. But you need to have people that you're close enough with, that you trust enough, that you have a kind of relationship with, that you can go to them and say, hey, when I'm getting off, when I'm starting to lack those little things, whenever you see these things happen in my life, if you see sin in my life, call me up, come to me, get in my face, and tell me what I need to hear. That can't be everybody. But if you don't have that kind of person in your life, it is going to be much, much harder for you to stay moving forward in the right direction. David here didn't just come to his senses. He was confronted. And and here's the reality for most of us, at least in my own experience and my experience with other people. Occasionally, occasionally, the Lord will, without any other person's input, prompt and convict somebody of great sin. But it's rare. The way that it normally happens in the biblical stories and in the Christian life is somebody comes to you and pulls you away. We all need different kinds of relationships in the Christian life. We need people that are going to push us towards Christ, and we need people that are going to pull us away from sin, temptation, and the enemy. Most of the time, that person can be the same person, but you need both of those things happening. And if you don't have anybody in your life that you're thinking of right now that you're like, yeah, if somebody came up to me, that if, if, if this person came to me and said, you are in great sin, you need to watch out and repent, and you wouldn't get defensive, you've got to have that person. You've got to have those people. And you've got to intentionally tell them it's okay. So you've got to have those people. Second, be humble when confronted. Be humble when confronted. David is king. There's literally nothing he couldn't do in this situation that would affect anything other than his relationship with the Lord. He's king. He can do what he wants in this situation, but he doesn't. He humbles himself 
And he does something that we all need to do whenever we're being confronted with sin. Fire your inner lawyer. Fire your inner lawyer. Whenever somebody comes up to me and, and, and kind of begins to press on some area of sin or unwise thing or anything else like this, my first initial response is, let me tell you all the reasons why I'm right and you're wrong. That's just my initial response. And most of us, that's how we function. We're confronted with sin and we begin to go in full-blown defense mode. No, 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 you don't understand. You, you got to get the context here. And this happened and this happened and this is why I did this. But you know what? Do you know what they did? Are you saying what they did is okay? You have to humble yourself to the point where that little lawyer in your heart doesn't prop up and get behind the stand and start giving all the reasons why what you did wasn't really all that bad and it's actually okay. And it's all, you gotta fire that guy. You gotta be able to be confronted, stay humble, and not get defensive. That's what David does here that saves him an even worse fate. Third part, repentance. What, what do you do after you have sinned, after you've been confronted, and hopefully by God's grace have been convicted of that sin and are ready to turn? What do we take from Psalm 51 here? A few observations from just the way that psalm is orchestrated. First, you go to the Lord. You go to the Lord. You go in prayer, you go in confidence, but you go to him. When you've sinned in these kind of ways, you go to him. Second, you own your sin. David doesn't try to say, well, but this happened. or that. He, I have sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. This is wrong. He doesn't try to soften it. And we're, we're, guys, we're guilty of that a lot, at least I am, of trying to, to soften a little bit the sin we commit. It's not that big of a deal. It's not that, it's like, it'll, it'll be okay. It's all gonna work out. You gotta understand these things happen because of this, this, this. And we, we try to explain away the sin. David doesn't do that here. He owns it. I did this. This was wrong. But he doesn't just own it. He hates it. You have to hate your sin. You have to hate your sin enough to leave it. You have to hate your sin enough to walk away. And after that owning and after that hating, there's a brokenness that comes to David. We have to be broken. This is important all because of the, the other side. If, if grace is going to really be amazing to us, we have to have the right picture of what our offense is. If we think we haven't been forgiven of all that much, we're going to cheat or we're going to treat grace pretty cheaply. Yeah, the Lord's forgiven me and I'm really grateful for that. But you know, I'm a pretty good guy. I haven't really done all that many bad things. And so God had to use crazy grace for David. But for me, you know, it's just kind of a, oh, man, I'm sorry. Don't do that again, please. We can't come into being able to sing songs like we sang this morning with a small understanding of what our offense is before the Lord. Or we won't feel the weight lifted if the weight we think we're under isn't all that heavy. So he owns his sin, hates his sin, is broken. And then he does something that especially I think for, for those of us in the evangelical spaces is important. He desires rightly relating over box checking. He says, you don't, you don't just want an offering. You don't want me to just go through the steps and do the right thing. Just, well, well, just go do this, 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 and this, and this, and then everything's going to be okay. He says, you don't want that. You want a broken and contrite, repentant Spirit, that you won't turn away. So when we sin, it, it, it's not this response of, all right, well, I just got to, you know, I got to start my Bible reading plan again. I'll make sure to be at church on Sunday. Do those things. Those things still end up happening in this psalm. But it only happens after the relationship is rightly restored. When the relationship is rightly restored, you can do those things. If it's not, if you don't deal with that first, it's going to feel hollow, incredibly, incredibly hollow. So desire rightly relating over box checking. And then the last thing that he does, keep moving forward. Go to the Lord, own your sin, hate your sin, be broken, pursue right relationship, and then keep 
moving forward. One of my favorite definitions of discipleship or the Christian life comes from Eugene Peterson. that just calls it a long obedience in the same direction. You and I are going to fall a lot. But the way even Paul talks about it is a race that is long and a race that we keep going in. When you fall, don't stay down. Don't turn the other direction. Even if you've got a limp, move forward. Keep going. Don't stop. And when we do that, we model what David does in Psalm 51. Lastly, looking at the fallout. One of the hardest truths in the Christian life that, that this story is brutal in. You will still deal with consequences for your sin. This one's hard. David is forgiven, but everything's not okay, if that makes sense. He's forgiven. He's cleansed. Even as the joy of his salvation does come back, but it doesn't make everything right. That's the hope that we look forward to in the new heavens and the new earth when everything's made right. But when we sin extravagantly, the wake of that is not going to be just little things that get fixed with forgiveness. Internally, we are made right. But externally, we are going to have to deal sometimes much longer than we had anticipated with the effects and results of our sin. But we trust God with the ending of our story because, and this is where for our heart, hopefully this is a huge drink of cold water on a hot day. Because of Jesus, you don't have to deal with the ultimate consequences. And because of Christ, we have this hope and this truth that we hold on to whenever we sin in ways like David or in our versions of what that looks like. God is a better savior than we are sinner. God is a better savior than we are a sinner. No matter how messed up you think you are, you actually are, no matter how terrible the thing that you've done in your life is or you think it is, the beauty of this story is that even someone like David will be forgiven and does not have the title of a man after God's own heart revoked. Why? He kept moving forward. He didn't stop worshiping the Lord after this. He, he took his forgiveness, he accepted the consequences, and he kept moving forward, knowing and believing that no matter how sinful he is or how messed up he is or the, the errors that he can commit, God is always going to be better at forgiving than you are at sinning. Every single time. So whether it's Abraham offering his wife to kings out of fear or Sarah letting her husband have a child with another woman and resenting her forever for it or Noah getting blackout drunk in front of his kids or Jacob being an awful deceiver or David and his sexual and violent sins, Moses being a murderer and prone to anger, Rahab being a prostitute, Peter denying Christ three times whenever he was most needed or Paul killing Christians and persecuting the church. If you think you are a sinner that has done terrible things, then you are in remarkably good company this morning. It's the story of everyone in the Bible that all of these people, us, get to come to the table and be called friend of God. That we can be forgiven and made right in our relationship with the Lord. And if you think you haven't committed sins, that are that heavy. You can go back and read that story that Nathan told later. Our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. And that is most and best expressed in the better David who didn't fail, who was always where he was supposed to be, doing what he was supposed to do, not taking what wasn't his, but laying down what was his for us. It's not selfish, but selfless so that we could come to him in all of our lifiness whether we caused it or not, and be washed, made right, forgiven forever. The reason we can have Psalm 51 is because of Christ. And we are often not awesome. And the people in the Bible are often not awesome. But he always is. He is always good 
and always faithful, even when we're faithless, which means we can go to him time after time after time with full confidence that he is going to be good and gracious and abounding in steadfast love. And we praise God for it. So with every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, the responses are are, are a couple of of different ways. It's a heavy message, a heavy morning. It's a heavy story and a heavy text. So our response, for those of us that know Christ and follow Christ, confess sin. Be in the habit of confessing sin. And do your life on purpose. Be where you're supposed to be. Do what you're supposed to be doing. Take care of the little things to guard the big. But when you do fail, and you will, go to the Lord like Psalms 51 shows us. Own your sin. Hate it. Be broken. Be concerned about your relationship with Christ, that that it's right and that there's fellowship there. And then just keep moving forward and don't quit. Worship because of the truth that we see in Psalm 51. An unbeliever or believer this morning, if if you're here and you're struggling with sin in your own life, hidden sin in your own life, please know in here it is so much better to confess and bring it into the light than having it dragged into the light. And know that there's nothing, if if this story tells us anything, it should at least tell us and give us the confidence that there's nothing that you have done, there is nothing weighing on your heart or your soul this morning that God will not readily, quickly forgive. You cannot out-sin the Savior. He can and will forgive you. So this morning, if you have been forgiven, praise the Lord and worship with all of your heart. And this morning, if you haven't ever been forgiven, if you're not in right relationship with Christ, do that this morning. Come talk to me after the service, see any of our staff. If you need to, take out one of those Red Connect with us cards and fill out your name and number and drop it in one of the boxes as you leave and we'll call you next week. But don't leave here this morning without praising the Lord for his forgiveness in your life, repenting of sin and following David's example where he is worthy of following example and running from it where we should be. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for the confidence that we have that because of the cross, there is nothing that we can't bring to you that you won't forgive. Lord, bless us this morning and give us grace to repent and continue moving forward. We love you. In your name we pray, amen.